With Shaking Cats and Kittens, Rob Lee here for this month's presenting sponsor, Night Owl Gallery. Night Owl Gallery is an intimate, artist-run exhibition space showcasing the original paintings and fine art prints of Beth Ann Wilson. Also, it features curated goods from local artists and craftsmen. You can be sure to find one-of-a-kind gifts, handcrafted jewelry, home decor items, along with a few vintage treasures. Located in the rear of 248 South Conklin Street in Highland Town, across from the Sally O's, Night Owl Gallery is a unique space that brings together Wilson's love of the arts, community, and culture. Additionally, Night Owl Gallery hosts an array of arts and crafts workshops throughout the year and participates in community events, many of which are free and open to the public. So in this ever-changing world, safety is their priority. So feel free to join them and hit them up online at www.nightowl.gallery. Tell them Rob Lee sent you. Welcome to Getting to the Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee, and this is on MTR Podcast. Today, I have the Community Engagement and Communications Manager of Baltimore Heritage, Inc., Molly Ricks. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for, for, for joining us. So, so let's let's get into it. We were having a the beginning of an interesting conversation about the the, the makeup of how Baltimore is set up a little bit. But um let's let's step back and start it off like it's actually a conversation on this this podcast. Uh tell us about your work, your background, your work with uh, Baltimore Heritage. Sure, sure. So I uh, started at Baltimore Heritage in 2019, in September 2019. Uh, So I had about six months of a normal career and then the pandemic hit, but we can get more to that later. Um, So just a little background on Baltimore Heritage. It's um, the city's uh, nonprofit historic preservation group. And it was started in 1960 by a group of volunteers who were protesting the urban renewal plans and the highway plans that were going to bulldoze through historic neighborhoods like Federal Hill and Fells Point. And and so it's because of groups like Baltimore Heritage, and there were some other ones too, that band together that we have uh, the Harbor Tunnel and and not a highway through downtown Baltimore and that sort of thing. So um, uh, the group uh, was all volunteers, started in 1960, and um, it's just two uh, employees right now. Well, 2.5, we have a a part-time employee as well. So it's me and then um, my colleague, Johns Hopkins, who's the executive director. Um, And uh, we, our job is to celebrate and uh, talk about Baltimore's historic communities and historic neighborhoods um, and in an effort to revitalize Baltimore and to really, you know, tell the stories of uh, Baltimore. So, um, I guess I can one of I can talk about my job a little bit maybe. Please. Um, so one of my main tasks is to coordinate and promote uh, tours around the city, and we do all kinds of tours. We do um, we call them behind the scenes tours. We go to factories. We go to. Uh, buildings that are still being rehabbed. Um, We go to wastewater treatment plants. Uh, We visit ships that are parked in the harbor. Um, We do all sorts. We do walking tours all over the city. Um, For example, uh, we talk, we we do a walking tour of civil rights heritage in Upton. Um, We do civil war history in Federal Hill. We do LGBTQ history in Mount Vernon. Um, So we just love talking about Baltimore's different communities. Another large portion of my job is something that started during the pandemic, which is um, we have a five minute histories series. Um, And we started that because um, the governor uh, said everything was shutting down in March, 2020. And we thought, oh, well, we should probably do something. And so we, um, my, my colleague John said, well, why don't I just talk about some place in Baltimore for five minutes and I'll send you the video and maybe you can throw some images in there. (laughs) And, um, and so we started doing that and it sort of unexpectedly took off. Uh, and we didn't know that the pandemic lockdown or whatever you want to call it was going to be so long. We we told our viewers, we would produce one every day. And then we realized that's exhausting. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, but, um, so we've scaled back a little bit, but we're still doing them and we have been, um, so delighted that people enjoy them. Um, I've learned a ton about Baltimore, um, you know, and we started just doing it from John's living room. Once we felt it was safe, he started going out and standing in front of different places that are important in Baltimore to talk about. Um, so we're just going to keep continuing doing those. Um, and if anyone's listening, we're always taking suggestions. So if there's any places we should be going. Um, 
And then my last big portion of my job is I, and this is one of my favorite parts is that I get to go out and meet with all different types of people all over the city. Um, Baltimore Heritage is getting to work with uh, the Bruce Street A Robber Stable and okay. you know, on a couple different projects. And that's been really awesome. I mean, that's such a Baltimore thing. Right. Um, and I particularly have really loved getting to know the stable owners, Dorothy and David Johns. Um, they're wonderful. Um, I also, as part of my job, get to be on the Laurel Cemetery uh, his, uh, Memorial Task Force, which okay. um, is trying to memorialize Laurel Cemetery, which is over um, kind of across from Clifton Park. Yeah. And um, it was Baltimore's first non-denominational cemetery for African-Americans. Um, and it was paved over in the 1950s with asphalt and made into a shopping center. And so um, I'm, it's just, I feel very grateful that as part of my job, I get to be on a, a committee that is trying to you know, bring this history to light. Um, and so I just, we get to work with university students and all sorts of different people. Um, so, and, and we do all of this at Baltimore Heritage to educate people about historic places in Baltimore in an effort to save them. Um, Cause we find that is the best way to revitalize uh, Baltimore and communities. So. That's, that's wonderful. I, I think it's, it's, it's great. Cause um, you know, as I was talking uh, before we got on and one of the things that I, I'm always on is, I think when you start taking away from the culture, from the heritage of a place, then you start, you, you enable other people to come in and kind of change what the identity and what the representation is. Like, uh, I, I, I like New Orleans. I, I go down there usually for my birthday and, you know, certain things that you know you're in New Orleans. You may see things that are new, but there are certain remnants that make it is that that make it that 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 show that this is this place that this is a southern city that has all of these different influences there. And some of the choices in terms of new buildings and the choices of de demolition and all of that, you're like ah, you're taking away from it. You're taking away from what's really here. And I remember when I first started coming to this realization it was so so long ago it was when. Uh, you know, Memorial Stadium, Stadium turned into like a, a home for the elderly and or in a Y and all of this. And it's like, this is terrible. And this is this is whack. And I like when a place has still has the, 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 the outside and it's like money was invested to fix it. So like the um, what is it? The Maryland Film Festival's theater. That's that that comes to mind for me or even what they've done with um, the Voxel, like. It's just this place has good bones. This place is in this area. Let's invest inside of it and let's try to keep some of its uh, aesthetic that is synonymous with the city. So what drew you to this field, to working in this field? Yeah. So um, personally, I've always loved history. Um, both my parents are authors and they write about in the historical field. And so I think it runs in the family. Most of my childhood dinners were talking about that, uh, just different parts of history. They still are when I visit my parents. Um, <laughs> I got my uh, master's in history at um, UMBC. And um, and so I knew I was going to go and, and do something history related. My first job actually out of um, graduate school was uh, as a researcher for the army. Oh, wow. um, and I loved the topic. I got to spend most of my time at the National Archives in College Park, and I was researching post-World War II Army intelligence. So, you know, espionage and <laughs> undercover work and all this sort of stuff. It was fascinating and um, triple agents and that sort of thing. <laughs> and um, but for me, I found one key thing was missing, and, and that was working with people. And, sure. and maybe being able to use my historical skills to help somehow. Um, and so when this job came along, um, I really grasped at the opportunity to be able to, you know, talk with lots of different people from different backgrounds and students and um, other history nerds and everything in between. And um, and so here I feel like uh, I've I feel like I don't know if I've helped that much, but I feel like I've been able to um, try. And and so that was that key part that was missing when I was um, just researching by myself was the human component um, of, the, yeah. of this work. Totally, totally. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I, I'll say um, in, in doing this particular podcast and been podcasting for coming up on 13 years and in the last, like, let's say two, two and a half, 
doing this one, it's like, oh, this is what it means to actually work with people and be around people. Not like the one or two people you might record with, that's a different situation, but being with a larger, more like, like broader group of people from different walks of life, it's like, oh, yeah, hey, we connect on this or, hey, wow, you go there too? Didn't know that. And, you know, you're able to kind of have that human component imp implemented into what you do. So <clears throat> Baltimore has a history. <laughs> what, what are, in, in, in various histories rather, what are, what are some of the stories related to Baltimore that particularly interested you? Sure. Yeah. So one of them, which you made me think about when you were talking earlier about, you know, saving the old bones of buildings. I love how you said that. Um, one that's actually related to Baltimore heritage is um, uh, this old building in the Coppin Heights neighborhood in West Baltimore. And it's uh, the oldest still standing Hebrew orphanage in the country. Wow. And yeah, and it's a beautiful building. Um, it kind of looks like a castle with these turrets at the top. And um, and it was vacant for many years in the 80s. And um, and Baltimore Heritage had gotten involved early trying to save this building from being demolished. Um, but it was sort of um, getting demolished by neglect. You know, trees were growing out about that sort of thing. And through the work of the Coppin Heights Community Development Corporation, which was just a group of, of community members there, um, Baltimore Heritage, um, and, and Baltimore Heritage helped, but I think the CDC was really the main um, group there. Um, the building is now, um, was able to be saved. Sorry, I'm not telling the story very well. Very good. Uh, um, the building was uh, able to be saved and it's now a community health center for the neighborhood. And this is a neighborhood that really needed a community health center. Yeah. There were not a lot of resources in this neighborhood. Um, and so it, it, this is, that is what we love about preservation, that we can save, we can talk about the history of this beautiful building. And then that building can be used for the people that live right around it. Yes. And, and that's just such a wonderful, that's what we want, you know, and it's, and so the building looks gorgeous. It's, you know, it adds character to the neighborhood and, and hopefully the neighborhood can, can use Use the uh, I think it's called the Center for Healthy Living, um, sure. and it's um, and so that's one thing you know that's uh, we love talking about that because that's really like a preservation success story you know Absolutely. Um, other other things that in other stories in Baltimore again the Laurel Cemetery story I think really needs to be told as much as possible um, partially like I look at that story and I think it was literally buried that the history of that site was literally buried yeah. and then put asphalt over it. And so um, that's one story I'm always trying to talk about. Uh, I think the story of the Lumbee Native American community in mm -hmm. East Baltimore um, can be talked to continue to talk about. Um, uh, there's a visual artist, Ashley Minner, who has done a lot in recent years to amplify that story. And she's a member of that community. Um, I, I just started, I mean, new things pop up every day. You know, when I start, this is what happens when I get to talk to lots of different people. Um, someone just told me about something called the Spite Wall in Lauraville, which uh, was when Morgan State was being built. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know the full story on this. And so this is something that I want to research more and I want to read about more. Um, but from what I was told, a Lauraville, a white Lauraville developer started to erect a wall to literally block African-Americans from coming from Morgan over into the Lauraville community. Oh, wow. And apparently there's a little bit of that wall left. Um, and so like, we need to talk about that. Yes. <laughs> we need yeah, to we talk do. about that story. <laughs> uh, and I guess for me, finally, one story that I think is important um, that I want to learn more about is Baltimore's Chinatown, which was yeah. on um, the 300 block of Park Ave and still slightly there. And um, I would love to know more about who lived and worked there and, um, and that story of uh, immigration that we have in Baltimore that's so crucial to our history. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, and then, sorry, this is a can of worms. We could talk here. I could. Oh, please, please. Things. But, um, you know, I think the story of the American um, slave trade in, in Baltimore yeah. can always be talked about more. I mean, we, we know the celebrated stories of Frederick Douglass. And, you know, that's such an important story to tell about him escaping from Baltimore. Um, but what about the, the not so... Uh, the stories that don't end well, you know, the stories right. of, um, you know, the 
trafficked humans that went from Baltimore down south in the second middle passage, you know, and, and that story. And so there were quite a few different, you know, what they called slave pens um, in Baltimore. None of them are still standing, but can we tell that story? And I yeah. think that's a really important one to tell too. Yeah, I, I think that um, people have this habit of we, we have one or two things that we can talk about and move on. And a place that is as old as Baltimore is and has had so many different, I guess, uh, uh, it's, it's like Madonna in some ways for me. <laughs> it's like you've had different lives. You Like as far as the city, if it was a person, it's like you've had different lives. So it's just like, it's, it's rich. It's rich in that way. Like I have this book that talks about some of the weirder poey and kind of things that mm -hmm. have happened in Baltimore. And it's like, we don't even get that. I think it's rich in that way that you can get a lot of either stories, content, it, books, uh, pop culture relevant things out of it. But we just kind of look at this one area and not look at what maybe has an impacted that or kind of led to that foundation of how these certain uh, socioeconomic things are within Baltimore. It's like, you know, you mentioned that, that the, was it the spite wall, you mentioned that, that is terrible. I, I'm a Morgan alum, that's terrible. So, you know, having that idea, it's like, oh no, this was created in this way to do this. So that, that, that should be a part of that conversation of why is the city like this? Well, that's an example that I'm just hearing about now, right? <laughs> so. And I think you touched on this, but if you want to hammer it home, speak <laughs> on the importance of historic preservation. Sure. Yeah. And I think you you touched on it, too. And so I'm, I'm grateful that you've, you've mentioned it. Um, I think I think sometimes people think that historic preservation is just, you know, for nostalgia. You know, oh, it's just a pretty place. We should just keep it. And and I think it's so much more than that. Uh, you know, in Baltimore, we have these former mill complexes along the Jones Falls, and then we have row houses in the center city. And then we have um, we have all of these different types of places that really are um, testaments to the history of, of Baltimore. And, and many of these places are centers of the city's ongoing revitalization, too. Yeah. And so there's it's connected to, again, like getting community members resources and and revitalizing communities. And so it's not just, you know, aesthetics. Um, aesthetics are wonderful and nice, but it, there's it's a deeper story. And so we strive to save these buildings um, because they tell the story of our city and they can inform the present also. Um, and I think uh, we, we, and so that's why at Baltimore Heritage, we have these strong education programs. We have the tours and we have, um, the, the five minute history videos in an effort to tell people about these places. Cause what we have found is when you, uh, when you educate people about these places and you, and they start to learn about it, they start to care about these places yeah. and that can be the turning point. Um, so, uh, we find it vitally important, important. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and so that's why we continue to, uh, fight for all places all over the city. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's good to, know that that work is being done because, you know, as I, as I touched on earlier, there's so many different things that are, are popping up that kind of have the same aesthetic. And I throw this joke around. It's like, I feel like everything is going to be a Shake Shack. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and also with that, it's, it's a certain, you know, air that goes along with it being a Shake Shack. And um, one place that's really important right now that I just want to make sure I mention because it's actually being threatened as we speak are some row, um, some alley houses on Sarah Ann street in Poppleton and the city wants to tear down these and picturesque row houses. I mean, they're so cute on the outside. They, they're all different colors, pastels, and they're occupied uh, yeah. by tenants and um, the city wants to tear these beautiful houses down um, in order to build a new development. And um, these houses, as I've just said, are really gorgeous, but they also have a really important history. And that's, uh, they were, they have been inhabited by black families since they were built in the 1870s. So these were places, and we know that we've looked at the census records and the group um, Organized Poppleton uh, has done a ton of research and they're really leading the effort on this. Um, but these houses have always been an affordable place for working class Baltimoreans. And so there's a ton of history here. And also they're they're being used. They, yeah. These are places that are 
homes. And so it's, you know, that's something that we're trying to help with as much as we can um, and amplify that story yeah. because these places that would be, I think it would be a disservice to, to obviously to the people who live there, but also to the wider community of Baltimore. Um, that's a history. These houses uh, are testaments to the history of that part of the city. So, yes. Um, one, one of the things I've, I've touched on, uh, kind of in the, the neighborhood I live in, in, in East Baltimore, like I've been here, I bought a house in, you know, this part of East Baltimore and I grew up here and it's the same area. So just kind of seeing it 20, 25 years later and, uh, seeing like, just, oh, we're going to tear this down. This building's not being used. Let's turn this into a parking lot and so on. And it's like, a lot of these things were abandoned. I kind of understand it. They may not have been safe. So on. And then you see certain things that are over here, certain businesses or hospitals and, and so on that kind of have some say, have some influence. That's, that's well and fine. But then there's no market here. There's, there's kind of this food desert idea here. And my thought is like, if we can get something here to be like a, a magnet, like, like a market, like something big. I was like, I don't feel like we have some of the infrastructure problems over here. You can't have a Trader Joe's over in this area for sake of argument and then not have working streetlights. I was like, that thing gets fixed. I was like, so all of this new um, stuff that's being created, kind of removing some of those uh, components of identity from this area and for different reasons, whether it's stuff that's really kind of needs to be shored up, but you're putting in these kind of sanitized, gray, uh, uncharismatic buildings <laughs> And just like, yeah, here you guys go. Here's places to live. It's like, these are people that are studying at the School of Medicine. They're not staying. They, they aren't really in the community. And you're not putting anything in the community. So it's like, what's all of this, you know, being busy to be busy kind of kind of vibe? And that's all I see. And that's all I've seen for the five years. And having the work that you've been describing in this podcast is important. And it needs to have more eyes and ears on it. That, that's that's just my assessment so far. Totally, I I totally hear you on that, and I've heard people call that gray color uh, gentrification gray. It's true. <laughs> What's the name of that color that gets painted a lot? <laughs> I, I was joking. I was like, I'm in the area pre gentrification. Chef, that's a coffee shop, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And gray and gray is my favorite color. Unfortunately, I might have to change it. I might have to change it to just like hotel black. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so. And this may be one of those other instances where you kind of hammer on that point again. How does your work or the work of the of Baltimore Heritage Inc. Uh, comment on social or political issues? Yeah, I mean, I think getting back to untold stories, uh, most of these untold stories are, are about BIPOC and other minority communities. And, and so I think it's really, at least for me, you know, growing up, mainstream history and the history we learned in school um, I don't think told the whole American story and, uh, and, and did not show that the stories of African-Americans and LGBTQ groups were important. Um, and, and so in a sense, these stories did not show that black lives mattered or matter right. today. And so I think for my own work is very much propelled by movements like Black Lives Matter and the ideologies behind the Me Too movement and that sort of thing. You know, let's let's tell those stories that are a little uncomfortable. Let's tell let's tell the stories of all people. Not because not only I I think it's more interesting and more real, yeah. but be also because it can help us inform the present. Again, like what's mm -hmm. going on today. Um, so for me, I think you know current social issues. For me, I'm always trying to check my privilege, make sure that I'm can try and see a little bit from a different point of view or, or, you know, talk about these things that, um, that have not been talked about for decades and centuries and that sort of thing. So, um, that's how my work comes into play. And then in terms of Baltimore heritage, um, I think, you know, sometimes, uh, we, we have to take a stand on certain issues. And so yeah. we can get into, uh, different things with other groups in the city and that sort of thing. But for the most part, I think people are pretty supportive of what we do. That's, that's wonderful. And yeah, I think I think being able to have those uncomfortable conversations and it, it leads to, to like you like you said, I think you said it really well, it informs the present. But I think also it's it's one of those things that it's discourse. Like if, you know, if it's not out there and it's hidden, we just like bury it, you know, then 
no one's talking about it. And if no one's talking about it, then there's no one's understanding. No one, it's a disservice to us as a, as a overall. And, you know, I, I had a conversation uh, last week after, after an interview I had and learned about some, some things about different places and different people. And I was like, huh, I feel like this is a Patreon only podcast right here. The Baltimore tea. I was like, I'm not going to do that, but I thought about it. And because you, you learn about these things and you want to just make sure you're, doing things that are congruent with your values and the work that you're doing is, is congruent with your values. And that's what I aim to do with this. And that's what it sounds like you and your in, in Baltimore heritage is, is doing. So that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Last, last couple of questions. Okay. Last three. Uh, I'm going to save one of them for yeah, well, last three. What is your most marked characteristic? I, I like that you asked this question because it made me think I was like, Oh, um, I think most people would first comment on my friendliness. Um, I, I love talking with strangers, you know, in line at the checkout counter or wherever. So um, I think that might be my most marked characteristic. I, I, also, I think I also have a pretty large nerd quality um, that as an adult, I have learned to celebrate. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think that's what it would be. Um, I try to be friendly because I get a lot out of, chatting with people so <laughs> i'm sure you know what that's like <laughs> sure <laughs> i'm playing a character here no. <laughs> no that's that's great and that's and that's that's what you came off as and that's that's what i'm getting off of you i definitely got the nerd energy and i was like i'm gonna let her say it i'll, I'll, I'll let you say it molly <laughs> it's quite all right I, I am, yes it is a part of who i am now <laughs> uh so uh how would you for, for someone that's listening, that's not been here, that's on the fence, and granted, we, you know, have different degrees of uh, safety questions that are in place in terms of the pandemic and all. Uh, how would you pitch Baltimore to someone that's listening to this, this podcast, this interview? Yeah, so this is a great question. And you mentioned it earlier. I think that Baltimore has often gotten a bad rep in the media. And I think it's really a mistake. Um, like, I'm just thinking the food scene, fabulous. Museums, yes. top notch. And, and this city is brimming with history and culture. And, uh, you know, Baltimoreans are friendly and weird. And I mean that in the <laughs> most like endearing way possible. I'm weird. Um, and, and the city is unique. You know, it has, uh, no other city has A-Rabbers and Mr. Trash Wheel and like the <laughs> market all in one. I mean, like, right. just like the, and, and from a history standpoint, and here's the nerd, Baltimore has so, so many significant places, you know, civil rights history, um, like just so many things here. 90 neighborhoods are designated as historic. Um, and there are two, and so that's, there's only one other city in the country that has more historic neighborhoods and that's New York which is huge. Yeah. Um, so, and then Baltimore also has 205 buildings that are on the historic landmark list. Um, and then that's only what's designated. There's so many more neighborhoods that could be designated, so many more um, yeah. individual places that could be designated. And so the city is buzzing with history and um, really has some like wonderful, unique things going for it. And so, um, yeah. so that's what my personal pitch is that like, I think you get everything and it's, and the, and Baltimoreans are awesome and weird. And wonderful. <laughs> so that's what I have to say. That's a great pitch. <laughs> <laughs> the last, last question is, it's not really the question. This is more of the me reformatting my shameless plug segment, but um, I'll just say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And is there anything else you would like to plug? <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Just a shameless plug. Um, I don't, uh, I don't think so beyond, you know, I would encourage people to check out, um, the petition for the Sarah Ann street alley houses. You can go to change.org and search Poppleton. Um, and you can sign the petition to help out that community. Um, and besides that, we'd love to Baltimore heritage would love to hear from you. So if this is the first time that you're learning about Baltimore heritage, check out our website, uh, baltimoreheritage.org. And, uh, we'd love to hear from you in any, um, questions, concerns about your neighborhood or um, the history of your neighborhood or your house, uh, we're here to help. Well, again, thank you so much. That's great. Um, so I'll sign off there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. 
So uh, for, for Molly Ricks from Baltimore Heritage Inc., I am Rob Lee saying that there is culture in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it. Mm-hmm.